we brought in additional sales reps during this period because uh, if you're going to be the company that survives this, which we obviously do intend to be, you need to come out of this with a, a nice, healthy pipeline. And so we hired quite a few salespeople during this period. And we have set them the same targets as pre-COVID. We have not reduced any of our sales targets. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Sales Biz. I appreciate you all taking the time. Before we kick off today's episode, once again, folks, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Like it if you follow this channel. And if you have any feedback at all, drop some comments down below. Today, my guest is a seasoned software professional with years of executive, board, and volunteer experience. He is currently the CEO of Velez, which is a global IT management company in the UK. And I'm super excited to have him join us today and share his journey. Mr. Sean Price. Sean, welcome, my friend. Thanks very much, Mike. Glad we could finally do this. You and me both, bud. Appreciate you taking the time. So let's kick it off, Sean. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your educational experience before diving into the uh, professional side. Where did you go to school? What did you major in? All that good stuff. Yeah, so that was uh, quite interesting, actually, because I was born and raised in the UK. Um, however, at, I think age 10 or 11, I moved out to southern Spain. And so I lived out in Spain for uh, you know close to 10 years. So, so educated in the uh, primary years of school in the UK and then in the sort of secondary uh, years in, in Spain, which is where I went to college. So, you know, fluent in Spanish language, which is great. And then I turned 18 and thought, hey, you know, I need to go to the, do the whole university thing. So I came back to the UK and uh, majored in computer sciences. And uh, my background was you know, in software. So computer science was a no brainer. Well, gracias for the introduction there. <laughs> I'm in California. Gracias and gracias are two different <laughs> things, but huge fan of Spain. I visited um, Valencia, Barcelona, Barcelona, and Madrid. Madrid was my favorite, my friend. Uh, Spain's absolutely beautiful. Out, outside beautiful. of London, of course, which we just talked about earlier <laughs> on today. Uh, awesome. And a little bit of, so how did you kick off your professional experience? Is software something you had a passion in or... Uh, did you start off any, uh, anything else to kind of grow into that industry? Tell us more about that. I think I had probably the most stereotypical entrepreneurial journey that, that there is, right? Uh, I mean, my, my parents were entrepreneurs and had, a, had an IT business. And I started, I started with selling, selling sweets and crisps and chocolates in my school when I was like seven years old, right? So uh, the school had their own shop, if you will, for students and I thought, hey, I've got connections. I've got people I can buy this from. So I'd buy sweets and chocolates <laughs> from like the local candy store and uh, sell it in the schoolyard for twice as much money. And that was, you know, sort of age seven or eight. And, uh, you know, I I'd had a computer since the age I was about four years old, I believe, with my parents having their IT business and just learning to tinker and take things apart. So as I'm doing that and I'm growing up, I'm learning, I'm learning programming. I'm coding when I'm like age 10. And uh, coding with anybody that is entrepreneurial and has a has a mindset to explore later turns into computer hacking, which is something I got into in my early teen years. Um, writing viruses, writing malicious code, and you know taking down small networks that were of my own of my own uh, property, of course. But that was that was my education. That was you know, hey, learn to tinker, learn to take things apart. And you end up developing this thirst for knowledge. And as that went on, I started a software company when I was 18 years old. Uh, I ran that for 10 years. It was a great, successful company. I absolutely thrived and loved working with developers because being a developer yourself, you then get to learn how to manage developers and how to grow that as a, as a business. And we were writing software and secure CRM systems for big pharmaceuticals and PLC. So it was a tremendous amount of fun. Absolutely. <laughs> FBI ever knock on your door? Because it seemed like you tinkered <laughs> a little too much, man. <laughs> There's always no to tinkering a little bit too far. And uh, yeah, I certainly got a slap on the wrist. Um, there was certainly a, hey, this is this is probably far enough. Um, but, you know, my, my thirst of, of knowledge and combining that with my entrepreneurial spirit 
it was, hey, let me start a software company where the software is inherently then secure. So match both passions with one. And, you know, that was a fantastic 10-year ride. And we exited that business in 2016 and, and uh, you know, moved forward. Uh, went into a stage of what I refer to as early semi-retirement for a couple of years. Uh, my son was born in that period and I got involved consulting and advising a lot of other tech firms in the area. Love it. Yeah, I think the majority of uh, FBI agents and all those stuff, when they catch kids like that doing brilliant things, like, hey, you either could go that way or you could come work with us and <laughs> do some fun things in your life as well. Uh, congratulations on the birth of your son, by the way. That's amazing. Um, and the exit you mentioned in 2016. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, starting a business is already uh, pretty gnarly, but actually selling that baby of yours is even sometimes harder. So tell us a little bit about how you made that decision. I think it was something that just had to happen in the end. Um, I'd started at 18, and by the time I was 28, I was uh, completely burnt out, completely mentally, physically exhausted. Uh, there's a lot of people, especially with the, the, the hustle porn and, and everything going on right now, yeah, where I actually did work 100 hours a week, every week, for close to 10 years. Um, wow. It hospitalized me more than once. Um, my wow. body shut down and you know you get to a point where enough is enough and it was a it was a decision that was made and you know, I'm, I'm happy I did that and managed to take like I say close to two years out to rest and recover and that two years of rest and recover was certainly needed yeah sometimes the mental ambitions far exceed the physical capabilities and they kind of meet in the middle sometimes usually ends up with someone on the floor so I'm glad you're okay you learn from your mistakes. And whilst I am still incredibly hardworking today, I do not put 100 hours in. And I do not put that emphasis on my team to, to do that. And we have a huge, huge work life, what I call integration perspective in our company, right? Because there is no balance. If you're an entrepreneur, I'm sorry, but balance does not exist. It is impossible to balance. <laughs> Right. I mean, you, you can argue this one all day long, but I, I just do not believe in balance. If you're trying to achieve something great, it's not possible. Yeah. Balance. Uh, someone told me balance holds back obsession. It's you kind of can't you can't marry the two in any way possible. If, if you're truly passionate about what you're doing, my wife's always knocking on my office door. What are you doing in there? <laughs> Whether I'm editing or reading something or watching something, but yeah, it's it's but it's 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 a myth, there's, but there's that time. it goes back to obsession. Exactly, it is. There, there's time for balance, and there's time for you know all of these things. But if you're especially early on in an entrepreneurship journey, there is no time for that balance. You have to go all in. There is no choice in the matter. And so the best thing you can do is is integrate the two sides of your life or the multiple aspects of your life, if there are. You know, I I'm. I'm a guy who gets out there, runs, cycles, and does triathlons. I'm a guy that has a wonderful partner. I have a wonderful son. I have this tremendous business. So it's how do you integrate it all? And in fact, one of my most popular LinkedIn posts only the other week was my now four-year-old son sat in our boardroom at the head of the table watching cartoons on the 84-inch TV screen in the boardroom because daddy had to go do some work that weekend, right? So it's, it's how you integrate it. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you take, it sounds like outside of family health, health is very important for you just staying active, but it sounds like you had some realizations that pivoted you into a different direction too. So that's, uh, I guess we'll call it a sabbatical, three-year sabbatical or. Yeah, well, it, it was like uh, 18 months plus two years sabbatical. Yeah. Beautiful. I, and the fact that Sean, not, not everyone has the, the brass to take that, you know, some people, develop anxiety stepping away from their email for four hours let alone taking a three a two year journey so kudos to you my friend what did uh some practices that you adopted during that because i imagine a lot of people especially the time that we live in are considering something along those lines yeah i think you, you're right about the email as well because when that happened i said it's gonna be no problem this will be easy sabbatical <laughs> life that's, that's simple and I think I took about a week to myself and just sort of slept for a week solid. And, and then I just started taking coffee meetings with every entrepreneur, every person who wanted to have a coffee meeting with me. 
for like six months solid. You know, I was Starbucks' biggest customer in London for a long time, just because I I needed to keep myself in the game. Right, I, I just had that that thirst to to just help and be involved and be on the circuit still. Um, but going back to what I mentioned about triathlons and marathons, I. I attribute triathlons and a, and a friend of mine in here in the UK who introduced me to triathlons as, as something that almost saved my life in a, in, a, in a way because it gave me an obsession that wasn't tied to a dollar amount, I suppose, right? And um, I did my first triathlon and I'd, I'd been in the sabbatical maybe a few months and absolutely just got hooked. And it was a similar sense of feeling in there was also an element of suffering, which I I find in business regardless. And, you know, that year, I think I did 15 events. Next year I did 16, next year I did 17 events, you know, and and just kept going. Um, But you've got to find structure and routine. And it's just like any day in business, you know, Uh, I'm a big proponent of having a huge amount of structure Um, I theme my days. So each day has a purpose and a specific topic that we work on. I time box. So I know that, Hey, I'm going to allocate this amount of time to this project or this task. And it was the exact same in that instance. It was, I know me and my son are going to go do baby yoga on the Tuesday. Right. And then come Tuesday afternoon, I got six back-to-back coffees. So it's just finding the routine that works. Absolutely. I think my biggest, you know, I completely resonate with that. Once you find that structure uh, and my structure is my Google calendar, everything from a reminder to a goal, to an event, uh, everything is color coded day by day. And that's how I'm able to meet guys like you. <laughs> it's uh, having a, that, you know, I think we, we rescheduled what three or four times to actually have this meeting, <laughs> yeah, but so, we're yeah. finally doing I'm- it. And we so, both have assistants and we still had to reschedule, right? So I mean, exactly. that's, just, that's just how crazy <laughs> life becomes. Exactly. But the fact that you allocate that time and eventually accomplish the goals, which is finally you and I get the chance to meet, I think that's the fruits of the actual process. So I completely resonate with that. Is everything, by the way, calendar on your end? Because I've met people that actually have it all in their heads. So how, how is your structure I like? <laughs> I don't understand those people. Uh, no, my, my, everything is calendared. Um, you know, we, we're, a, we're a Microsoft uh, house, so, you know, we're on 365, whatever else, but everything is calendared. My assistant has access to my various work calendars. I also have a uh, personal calendar. I have a calendar shared with my partner. I have a calendar for my son's activities. And like I say, I, I theme my days. I know that Mondays are management, which is my one-to-one with each manager plus a weekly sync with the whole management team at once. And then any, any business administration thing that's need to happen, you know, Tuesdays, products and services, Wednesday, sales and marketing, Thursdays, recruitment, Fridays is um, culture, uh, culture and finance. Sorry. Saturday strategy, Sunday rest. Like if you can get it down and get it on a calendar and, you know, everyone in my organization and my personal life know that if it's not in the calendar, it does not happen. Amazing. Hey, you forgot to take, you forgot to pick up the groceries from the store. Was it in my calendar? <laughs> That's literally one of the most asked questions in my household. I kid you not. Why is it mm-hmm. on our calendar? When are we putting it on the calendar? So I will tell you though, my, uh, one of my family members, wildly successful businessman, global, um, you know, we have a meeting coming up. I invited him over for lunch. We were just having dinner yesterday and I invited him over on the 31st. Uh, to host at my place and i always ask him though how do you manage your day-to-day and he says it's all up here i said how is that possible he says you know back in those days those were the guys that you know if you could retain that information without having to write it down but know everyone's by name and know every have keep it all memorized that's how you made your life a little easier we didn't have google cows back back in those days so for sure. And we are way too reliant on technology nowadays, right? When, when you've got, exactly a, when you've got a device, you've got a device on your wrist that says, hey, you need to stand up, right? We're too reliant. Um, yeah, these things, <laughs> it's, it's all over the place. Absolutely. It's... Absolutely. But it, it's, it's what we need today. And I think the information comes at us so much quicker than it ever did before. Uh, yeah. And, you know, whether it's a reschedule or cancellation, you know, you, you not waiting for an inter-office memo to be printed out and passed around anymore, right? It's 
it's Absolutely. I'm getting 400 emails a day. And then you've got Slack and Teams and text messaging and whatever else. There's a lot of information now. And I focus quite a lot on turning that um, input volume all the way down. Amen to that. And I'm actually glad you brought that up because another person I talked to that not he's a he writes things down, not necessarily uses technology for it, but he says, you know, all the things you have on your calendar, you know, all that stuff that you're doing could potentially be contributing to the reason why we have so much anxiety happening, so much ADD happening now. If you have more stuff that you could do that you can't remember, basically, it's already a, a cause for concern. I don't necessarily agree with it. I feel I like the fast paced nature and I'm sure you do too. But he also makes a good point because sometimes that level of stress could potentially cause uh, something that you had early on medically wise. A hundred percent. You know, I can run 99% of my business now from the mobile device, right? And pre-COVID times, uh, you know, the last calendar year when we weren't in COVID, I flew 70 something times in a year. Wow. And it's been able to get off a plane, shoot a quick email and be done with it, right? Move on to the next thing. Whereas, yes, it creates anxiety, but it also helps relieve some of that anxiety. And you've got to have the team in place to manage it. My Absolutely. VP of global sales flew with me to Toronto a couple of years ago. And at the time, he was still building his management structure in the sales department. And we get off this eight-hour flight to Toronto and he's just a nervous wreck. Like I've had eight hours without email, like, you know, what's going on, what's happening. But you know what? He landed, checked email. We built the team to a point where it was pretty, pretty strong. Everything was fine. But the anxiety for eight hours, too much. Yeah, definitely has a lot of residual effects. So it cost, could possibly contribute the the overall goal of traveling in a negative way. So a lot of connotations there. But I, I appreciate the hustle on your side, Sean. You and I definitely resonate. We're on the same page there. Let's get a little into the COVID side of the field. You brought it up earlier. How is that, you know, from my understanding, guys like you and I that embrace technology early on are actually in the plus right now. But talk us a little bit about how your business is going and how has COVID impacted it? So our business is looking after enterprise and data center, right? So as, as an IT services business, we don't look after uh, the mom and pop shops. We don't look after, you know, my, my printer stopped working. That's not where we, that's not where we deliver. We deliver to the fortune 500. We deliver to enterprise and data center environments. So for us, business just ticked all the way up as soon as COVID happened, which was great uh, in the sense of we were able to keep busy. And because we deliver globally, um, in the first quarter of 2020, when sort of China and Asia was sort of taking a big dip, it was fine because we had Europe. And then sort of Q2, Europe got hit, but sort of China began coming back out of it again. So again, we were still able to deliver almost seamlessly. I think the problem for us became we had to hire and we had to hire fast um, just to keep up with demand. But at the same time, you've got big corporates are closing the wallets and slowing down the payments. And, you know, that causes a huge issue for anyone in a supply chain. So that was probably our biggest, our biggest battle was dealing with big corporates that just didn't want to pay you anymore or wanted to slow down paying, but still wanted the service in the next two hours. Right. So interesting balance. But I sent an email out um, quite early on in the in the whole um, pandemic and said, look, guys, there is a pandemic happening. There's a recession coming. All of these things are occurring. We are making, as a management team, we are making a proactive decision not to participate in the recession. Therefore, guys, as it's printed on our walls, we do whatever it takes. That's the motto of the business. Yeah. Uh, we, sent everyone, we sent everyone home early before the lockdowns occurred. Because we're a technology business, right? Everybody's geared up to work remotely straight away. Um, and, you know, we just scaled up everything we were doing on mass, right? HR team, get more people in the HR team, look after people's well beings, send them gifts. It's their birthday. Hey, still send them the cake. They can't have the cake in the office, send it to the home. So we just scaled up. And the thing that I talk about quite a lot within our business is that we are doing empathy over EBITDA, right? And that's it care about the people above and beyond the profits because right now yes yeah, some businesses are up a lot of businesses are down but net net no matter how you look at it we just got to get through this simple as that 
Yeah. I love that. I mean, it sounds like you're not just worried about the professional side of things, which is obviously important to keep those uh, paychecks coming in, but the morale, the focusing on your employees' well-being and making sure they're focused in the right direction. I think that's probably the most important is having without your people, there is no process or business. So kudos to you, my friend. Yeah, we didn't, we've not done a single Zoom quiz. Like we, we didn't jump on the Zoom quizzes and, and that sort of bandwagon. But rather, they were mental health check-ins, making sure that everyone was, you know, coping. And yeah. yeah, we do the weekly calls where we've got the whole company involved or teams involved. But you've got to care about the people first and foremost. And we care about our own people. We care about our customers, people, and our suppliers as well. So absolutely, take care of the people around the world, and it will all come back to you tenfold. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about on the uh, management side, specifically from the accounting standpoint. Obviously, a lot of budgets have been scaled up, as you mentioned. A lot of wallets pull away, pulled uh, put away. But uh, you know, the, the lights still need to stay on. So, what are some strategies that you've adopted as a leader to hold your customers and suppliers, vendors accountable? To you know, you know we we did the work, so you have to get paid. Because I'm seeing a lot of friction on that side, not just in the UK but globally. I think one of the big things to understand is that accounting teams are doing their job, which is they're just trying to keep cash flow sane, right? So it's not the company per se. It is that accounting department doing what they think is right, just like every other department and every other company is doing what they think is right for their business at the time. Right. So there's certainly been some large corporates where I've had to pick up the phone to the CEO of the company and go, hey, you're, uh, you're net 60, um, but you haven't paid us in 190. And quite honestly, most of the time it is, well, hell, I didn't know that was the case, right? The account department's just trying to conserve cash. So a lot of the time it's, it's bringing back that human element to what is ultimately just a transactional departmental issue. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's been cases where the UK has not been fantastic at, at supporting businesses with with uh, funding options for, during this pandemic there has been some but not a great deal but certainly what we've done is we've looked at who are our smallest um vendors who are our smallest companies in our supply chain that are probably going to be hurting the most let's make sure that we keep keep that momentum going to pay those guys as quickly as possible right right we've got to manage our own cash flows but ultimately um i read yesterday 10,000 restaurants and bars in the UK have closed down as a result of the pandemic. 10,000, right? And that's not that's to insane. count retail and everything else that's happened. So how do you support those who are ultimately going to be struggling the most? And it's just having conversations with people, you know? Yeah. Um, you can't save the world. Uh, we can't save the world. Our customers can't save the world. So whilst everyone's struggling, the only strategy is to talk and that's right. what we have found best uh, we're talking with our customers every single day we've got a customer at the moment who would typically pay us their net 60 they pay in 55 right they pay early they're over 200 days on invoices right now we know they're struggling so there are right. conversations going hey how can we support you to the point of us still being able to work for you uh, without having to put you guys on stop but how can you also support us by actually releasing some cash, even if it's every now and again, right? You may not be able to make that lump sum payment that's owed, but hey, start trickling some down just so that we can keep our own lights on, as it were. Yeah. And at that point, just from a strategic standpoint, do you get legal involved? Do you put something in writing or is it sometimes as easy as just an email back and forth? Like what strategies have you have adopted uh, to make sure we're holding ourselves accountable outside of just, you know, words or maybe words is, suffices. I find that words are probably the first place to go to, right? Because the second you bring legal into it, it's, it's, it's almost more personal. It, it's a, it's a, Hey, I don't right. trust you not to pay me. Right. And we've had clients of ours that have filed for bankruptcy in the U S uh, during this period and left us with a huge hole. Um, and at that point, what can you do? There's not a great deal, but yeah, we, we try and have a phone call first. We try and actually have that discussion. 
put it in an email, you know, include relevant people within the business so that we can try and get this sorted out. Because like I say, the bigger the company, the, the less those are both seem to know what's going on. Yeah. Well played, my yeah, friend. Legal has to come into it sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah. And what about new customer acquisition, Sean? You know, you're already dealing with quite a bit of a mess with existing customers. You know, churn is a terrible word in the business. But in terms of new customer acquisition, what kind of uh, standards or expectations do you set in advance from a monetary standpoint? I think probably the best thing we did during the pandemic was go, hey, let's ramp up our sales development uh, team, right? So we brought in additional sales reps during this period because uh, if you're going to be the company that survives this, which we obviously do intend to be, you need to come out of this with a, a nice, healthy pipeline. And so we hired quite a few salespeople during this period. And we have set them the same targets as pre-COVID. We have not reduced any of our sales targets. It's both motivational and unmotivational at the same time, if you think about it. But you know, when we're still able to hit or get close to personal quotas on the sales side, despite what's going on right now, we're seeing that as a result of some of our competitors going out of business. Some of our competitors are not able to service, so we're able to pick that up. But yeah, we've hired more salespeople. We've hired more sales reps to do lead generation. And we've gone, right, you know, this was the pre-COVID target. Still exists. Let's go get them. And I'm Love proud it. to say, I'm proud to say that they are absolutely smashing it, which is, it's amazing to see that despite what's going on in the world, a lot of people still know that they want to get shit done. Love it. I was just about to ask, how do you motivate sales reps who are not performing <laughs> in this type of economy? But sounds like it's exactly the opposite. They're doing everything that needs to be done. So I love it. The biggest problem is that they're not around each other to boost each other up all the time, right? My, my VP of sales is on the phone every single day to his team, be it the team leaders, be it the individuals. And as much as he would like to think he's Wolf of Wall Street sometimes, you know, it is just <laughs> delivering that motivation all day, every day, keeping people propped up because it is a hard time. Um, yeah. Understanding, going back to that empathy over EBITDA, understanding that, hey, whilst we're going to want you to achieve this, we do get that it is incredibly difficult to do so during this time. Yeah. But go, go get them nonetheless. Yeah. I mean, I've mentioned this on podcast on my podcast numerous times. I can't tell you how much I miss the, the sales meets and the kickoffs and the, the president's clubs and the happy hours and the conferences. Like, I think we as general salespeople just need to be out there to have that level of reassurance and excitement and uh, communication. But have you seen any sort of slump on your team's end to say, you know, this, Sean, I don't know if I could do this anymore. Like, uh, are you seeing some of that? And what advice do you have for leaders to deal with that level of, uh, I wouldn't say negativity, but more of transparency uh, when it comes to, you know, coming out to your leader like that? I think the two things that we've seen the most are the sales guys that are used to jumping on a plane and going and visiting their customers. And we're very much in a, in a situation where, almost all of our big accounts and big deals happen over steak. Steak and wine, that's where most <laughs> of your business happens, right? It's a true story. And uh, that, that's my favorite. That. <laughs> that is, you're speaking of my language. It's ribeye, yeah. mashed potatoes, spinach, wine, and a good time. <laughs> You've got it. You've got it. And to not be able to do that nowadays, uh, there's uh, definitely been an impact as a result of that. You can't deny it. And as much as business travel is nowhere near as glamorous as many people would like to believe it is, I'm kind of missing the window of seat 3A, you know, and getting out there in front of customers is, is tough. So giving the guys all the tools they need and the understanding of, hey, this will come back someday. I don't think it'll come back to the same amount. I don't think we'll be out there as much as we used to be but I think it will have to come back soon. But on the other end of the spectrum is those guys that are going, hey, my biggest customer just went bankrupt. That's my biggest account and my biggest source of uh, compensation sales commission 
like what now? You go, hey, yeah. the world's a crazy place right now. And we've got a fantastic team of lead gens. We've got a team of account managers and account execs who are there to you know, refill that pipeline for you. Just keep your head down, keep focused. And it's tough, but it's a lot tougher for a lot of other people right now who are really struggling in some very, very real ways. Yeah. One thing I adopted, by the way, as a substitute for the steak and stuff is if I have a Zoom call with someone, I'll Uber Eats them a lunch or something. Excellent. It's worked. And it's also been like, okay, how'd you get my address? But it's, <laughs> uh, it, it's you, know, you have to pivot. It was where I was going with that. You know, that's yeah. one of the things I'm trying to tell other salespeople because you know, I'm staying motivated, but I've always been into the Zoom and tech game. Not everyone it was that, you know, some, some people were doing real estate, some people were doing insurance sales and mm. uh, other things. So, you know, just continuing to pivot into a direction of creativity, I think is the most important thing right now to, uh, for salespeople to really stay in the head in the game. Well, look, I think this is very, very much going to um, create a new, I want to say a new level, but a new type of salesman, right? Yeah. Because there are those who love to go out and do the steaks and wine, but they could not pick up a phone and close a deal. They could not build a relationship <laughs> with a customer unless they were in that situation. Right. And I think you've had the polar opposite. Those who are great at doing things over the phone and email, but could never sit down with a customer face to face for whatever reason. And I think now you're starting to see an interesting combination of those skill sets. And you're starting to see some sales guys or sales girls who are showing what they're capable of under different circumstances. Absolutely. No, 100% agree with you. And for someone that wants to get into sales, obviously this is a majority sales podcast. What advice would you have someone that's needing to pivot away from uh, just regular door-to-door -door sales or retail sales and have to kind of get into the whole SDR business development over the laptop situation, what advice would you have for someone, for someone that wants to get into that world? Uh, interestingly enough, when we, when we take on SDRs, they're typically people that have come from different industries and have no idea about what an SDR even is. And we kind of have to educate <laughs> them along the way, right? Um, the thing that we tend to tell people the most is be prepared to feel like you are on the very first step of your career all over again. Doesn't mean you are, but be prepared to learn everything from the ground up. And what we tend to see is people who have come from real estate, uh, people that have come from retail particularly, they come into this type of sell and just feel completely and utterly lost. But you get them a month into a good sales training program and we give everyone a great, great training program, then you see how quickly they develop and really, really get up to speed. So almost feel prepared to be a little bit lost for a little while, I would say. Um, but if you're good, I mean, you, you can sell anything to anyone. If you're a good salesperson, you just got to learn the ropes, learn the techniques and learn the industries. And a great company will give you all the tools that you need to achieve it. Absolutely. Do you follow a specific methodology for your specific company, like a Sandler medic or anything along those lines? No. So we very much build everything from the ground up ourselves. You know, we've, nice. we've looked at everything out there. We've uh, reviewed everything. And depending on who you ask, they'll tell you about strength finders or they'll tell you about disc profiling. They'll tell you about, you know, any kind of sales system out there as well as profiling. But the best thing is for our industry, which is very, very niche. You know, there's a lot of companies that are just doing things, a carbon copy of each other in our industry. And we said, hey, let's start this from scratch. Let's do this our own way. And a lot of our competitors, particularly in this country, they're all using the same methodology. They're all using the same documentation. They're all using the same tactics day in, day out. And that's mm -hmm. why they can be around for 30 years and still be plateauing. And with my background in software and automation and machine learning, when we started this business, it was, come on, guys, why do we want to do the way they've been doing it for 30 years when we can revolutionize and not just rip off so no it. when it comes to sales when it comes to service delivery everything was thought off from the ground up love it well done uh 
last question for you, Sean. Uh, this is one of my favorites in terms of going back to if you had a time machine and you met your 18 year old self, what's one piece of advice would you give yourself? Knowing what I went through and what I did to myself. It would be around who are you trying to impress? I love that. that ego of yours trying to prove. Um, and I think, you know, whether you're the CEO of the company or whether you're a VP of sales, you know, you're both in the sales game. Right? There's nobody that sells better than those two roles in the company. And I think naturally both of those types of personalities have incredible egos and tending to come from a place of trying to prove something to somebody. And so I think if I was stood with my 18 year old self, it was, Hey, this is going to hurt. This is going to take a lot away from you, but it's also going to give you a lot. Uh, who are you trying to okay. prove to be careful, but it's going to be one hell of a ride. Love that. Well, going back to your candy bar sales as a seven-year-old, doing 2X margins and now working with S&P 500s, uh, truly blown away by your journey, my man, and specifically the way you advocate for your employees. You know, you, I definitely see a good culture within not even ever talking to any of them. So really appreciate you taking the time, Sean. Thanks for sharing all the insight and don't forget to stay in touch, my friend. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Take care, buddy. Thank you.